back. Pulls up the three. Boom! Knocks it down. Curry from the corner at three. Puts it in. For overtime. Makes it. Garrett. Welcome to the latest edition of the MVP cast from me, Mark Woods. My guest on this edition is Tia Waleji, guard for the Caledonia Pride, international for Cameroon, graduate of Princeton. And at this moment, we're sitting in a coffee shop in Edinburgh where she's midway through an interesting first year overseas. Welcome to the MVP cast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Let's talk about your experience here first. I mean, coming out of college, obviously everyone's first season overseas is, is very different. You're taking a kind of step into the unknown. How's it been for you? Um, it's been really great so far. I mean, my teammates, my coaches, um, even like my professors have been really, really welcoming and accommodating to me and have really made me feel at home. So I think that's played a big part in me being able to um, adjust so quickly and perform well, not only um, on the court, but also in the classroom. Coming out of Princeton, so Ivy League, the kind of degree that everyone always wants, set you up for life. What made you think, I'd still like to play some more basketball rather than going and earning big bucks somewhere doing something I'm going to say more important, but something significant. Mm-hmm. Um, basketball has always been such a big part of my life. I mean, I've been playing since I was about six years old. Um, and it's just been something that's been so um, close to my heart. And I thought it'd be a really cool experience to be able to use that to travel, um, see other places, see other cultures, uh, meet new people, and to experience something that I probably wouldn't be able to without basketball. You, you did your degree in biology, but you're doing your, your master's in is it sports policy management, that kind of area. Is, is this the sort of thing of, a, I've, I don't want to do the lab anymore, I want to do something that's basketball sport related in the future? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I really, really enjoyed biology and the sciences um, in undergrad, but I didn't see myself uh, making a career out of it. Um, and I obviously really love basketball and sports in general, so I wanted my career to kind of uh, focus or be close to sports so I thought that um, like sports management sport policy could help me do that we talked about Ivy League and obviously in America those are the elite universities the Oxfords and the Cambridges of the US and Princeton has such a big history with basketball with the Tigers program and obviously the, the schemes that have come through it but ultimately, those are universities where you're there for academics. You know, the brains, the, the bright young brains of America go there. Hard, difficult, or what's the challenge you have going somewhere like that to balance getting the most out of your basketball career, but also getting the, taking the most advantage of the academic opportunity? Yeah, um, it's definitely a challenge, especially your first couple of years there. Um, I'd have to say the main thing um, is time management and prioritizing what needs to be prioritized. Um, basketball and school were obviously a big commitment while I was there. So just um, really putting most of my time into those two and focusing on them, making sure that I could do the best in each of those. Was there a choice for you going coming out of high school? I'm sure you were, you were recruited with your high school career, recruited in other places. Was that for you the biggest thing to go to a great school over maybe a greater basketball school? Um, for me, yes. Um, basketball obviously is going to end one day, and I'd like to have um, something else to not will fall back on and be able to um, still co- like contribute to the world, contribute to my community, um, even when I'm not playing basketball. So Princeton was definitely um, my number one choice because I know it can set me up for opportunities outside of basketball as well. There's, there's a quote on your Twitter feed, and I'm going to cite it to you here. It says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I mean, as someone coming out of an Ivy League school, where do you see that? that power that you want to have or want to utilize? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that power comes from just the knowledge I've acquired at um, Princeton and um, attending there, but also through the relationships I've made. I mean, Princeton is such a diverse school and you meet people from all types of backgrounds and all types of cultures. And I think um, just that knowledge and learning about the world and about yourself is what um, makes us as humans just so powerful and gives us the ability to give back to our community. Is that important? I mean. Obviously, we sit here looking at America from afar, but in terms of the African-American community, and you're literally African-American, first generation. And when you go to somewhere like Princeton, is there more of a pressure on, on you going there to excel and to, and to stand out, but then also be able to, to put something back somewhere along the road? Um, put something back in what? In terms of you know taking that back to your community or being a role model or in reinvesting that? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, Princeton and the Ivy League in general isn't, it's diverse, but not as diverse as obviously um, other universities. So I think 
um, being a, one of the fewer African Americans on campus, there is a little bit of a pressure to kind of be a role model for younger African Americans who aspire to get a great education that Princeton has to offer, other Ivy Leagues have to offer, um, and just showing them that the color of your skin doesn't determine how great you can be or how, where you can go to school or the success you can have. I was reading an article recently about someone who was at Cambridge, and again, another university that well known in it for its lack of diversity, shall we say. I mean, is it a weird thing to be on campus where you're very much in a minority? Um, so I grew up in Overland Park, Kansas, which is a very predominantly white area, so I've kind of gotten used to um, being the minority. Um, but it's always a challenge, it's always a little bit difficult, just not always having people who can relate to you as much, but definitely at Princeton there is a small community of African, Africans and African Americans that I definitely felt um, close-knit with and who really helped me um, grow and also embrace my, my heritage and my culture. Probably set you up very well for living in Edinburgh, one of the l- so we say least diversities in the UK. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hi, um, I mean, your dad... Um, I'm sure a big influence has coached you. Play for Cameroon national team back in the day. What's how much of an influence was he in you bringing you? Your two sisters play basketball as well. How much of an influence was he in getting you into this sport? Um, I mean, it, he was basically everything. Um, I wouldn't even be interested in this sport if it weren't for him. Basically, since we could walk, he introduced us to the sport. But then as we um, grew up, he was not only our biggest critic but our biggest um, supporter in everything we did. Um, whether that's taking us to the gym, get extra shots, um, you know, critiquing our game after we played and showing us we can do better. Um, I mean, we and myself, I wouldn't be here without his um, his expertise and his leadership throughout my life. How much was he? Because he, if I understand, he went from Cameroon to the UK to US and then got his degree in the States, etc. I mean, how, how much, I guess your mother as well, how much was that for them that, yeah, you can do this, but you've also got to get your academics right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's always been the main thing. They love us playing sports, but um, it's always been about academics. And what they've really um, tried to help us understand is that sports can actually help you get a good education and help you be able to travel like I am now and see other things. So just using sports as like a means to um, get a good education and overall get good experience. Your dad, Conrad, was he playing for a national team. How have you ever seen any footage of it? Were there photos of it? What, what have you found? So I've actually tried to look him up a couple of times, but it's hard because it was so long ago. There wasn't as like much social media and um, videotaping and all that. Um, he has pictures and maybe some videos at home, but I haven't seen them yet. But I'm very keen to <laughs> see them one day. <laughs> Did he talk about it much? Um, a little bit. What I've heard from most is actually like his um, teammates or his siblings or people who knew him when he was playing and still know him today who have said. Um, that he was such a good player, that he could do all these things, but I still haven't seen it yet, so I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> You've just seen the stats somewhere in a random market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where, where did he live in the UK and for how long? Um, so it was somewhere around London. I can't remember the exact city. Um, and he went to um, boarding school here when he was in his 20s, I think, so before he went to the States for college. Um, I think it was maybe like three, four years that he was here. But he really loved it. Um, and his older brother went with him, too. So they had a great experience. Um, they played soccer while they were here, so it didn't play as much basketball. But, yeah. Like most people in this country. <laughs> right. <laughs> How, when you're growing up, and your, your sister was at Brown, I believe, and your younger sister's now at Penn. Good. Glad I got this the right way around. Um, what was, where was the focus for you guys in, into basketball? Was it just something you was always there, or was it something you guys, one of you played and the other two felt the need to be competitive and join in? Where did it all start? Um, well, I'd have to say it started with my oldest sister um, when she first started playing when she was younger, and then as the rest of us came along, we just jumped right into it. Um, it's kind of been something very special to all of us because it brings us together in a very unique way. Um, but yeah, it's just been the really like center part of our family. Essentially, we always call ourselves like the basketball family. So, <laughs> growing up in Kansas, was it, was it battles in the driveway until death? Or in an the evening, what was the dynamic? Um, actually, we didn't really go against each other that much. Um, we were a couple. So I played with my sister in high school, and then a couple like just friendly games with my younger sister. So we never really went against each other. We're mostly on the same team. Um, but yeah, didn't really have that competitive blood against each other. It's not done you any harm though. You yeah. seem to be doing okay. Yeah. With with seeing your sister in college, you know, a few two years ahead of you, roughly. Uh, three years. Yeah. With seeing her in college, did that 
I guess at some point maybe you think, yeah, I want to do this because it's, you know, it's a decent school you maybe see occasionally in TV. Does that make you think, yeah, yeah, that sounds kind of cool? Yeah, so actually before my sister went to Brown, I didn't really even know much about the Ivy League and didn't really have uh, much interest because I didn't know. But um, once I saw her go there and um, she just really opened the door to my future and opened my eyes to see that there were so many really amazing institutions in the East Coast that I could attend um, through basketball. And she was definitely like the the trendsetter for that of our family. It's pretty cool. Three sisters, three all playing basketball, all Ivy League. That's quite a nice trio. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Thank you. Does that, I, I, did you always sort of maybe push one another to be, again, it goes back to maximizing your abilities. Was it that sort of thing of, yeah, we, I've seen one person study hard, but also play, so I have to do the same? Yeah, for sure. Um, going back to my older sister, um, she's always been the brains of the family. I mean, now she's at med school, so she's um, always set that like really high standard of, not only achieving on the court, but achieving in school. Um, and just through her, we've seen that, um, we've just seen the hard work, persistence, and where those can take you in life. At Princeton, you, you did some marketing work as well, and there was, you know, amongst the other interests there. And for, for, I guess people here, we always look to the States for trends, learning points, etc. cetera. We, you're, you're at a school that's maybe, it's not on national TV, so it's not the most high profile. So when you're doing that on the side, what did you kind of learn there from, maybe trying to push that into the public eye get people to buy tickets take it pay attention to it what what things did you see there that you think actually you could probably apply that over here um apply it in what sense in terms of you know how you market how you sell how you promote the game of basketball um i mean i think the biggest thing is relationship with people and finding things that people can relate to um, obviously people will like want to buy things and are interested in things that they can personally connect to so I think just finding that connection and finding something that draws people in is the best way to market I'm not sure if I answered your question really well how have you seen that I man I saw you last weekend at the Scottish Cup finals there's a you know a small scale event and obviously there's the pride games you go to other teams around the country what's your impression of the way that this league is marketed and gets promoted um, the WBBL Actually, I've been really impressed with um, this league. It's run very professionally um, from the live stats on the league to everything is very, or on the website, I mean, everything is very updated. Um, and even the games are very well run. Um, and I think that, I don't know about the other teams necessarily, but our games I know are marketed very well. I know Frazier does a really good job with um, promoting our games. And even we had like little Scottish tour and went around Scotland to play different um, in different areas. So I think actually it's, um, I was very impressed with how well the league is run and also Caledonia Pride program is run. We're almost at March, which I guess must be a nice special time for you. I mean, you think at three appearances in the NCAA tournament, What's that like as a player? Because we kind of see it from very much afar here. But when you're in the inside of it this time of year, you probably know that you're going. And you guys were winning so many games, you probably knew pretty early that you were going to. What's the kind of excitement and build-up level like for that? Yeah, I mean, those were some of the most exciting times um, of my college career. And I was actually just thinking a couple weeks ago about how fortunate I was to be able to do that because there's obviously a lot of players who go through their college experiences and don't get to experience the NCAA tournament. Um, so I think that was just, that was one of the highlights of my career, just playing against um, the top of the top competition and playing on the national stage in front of so many eyes. Um, it's just it's such a, such an amazing time, such an amazing period, and I'm really looking forward to uh, now supporting uh, the Princeton Tigers. Hopefully, they can make the tournament again and go far in it too. Is there more or less pressure when you're an Ivy League school? Because for those who don't, I guess, understand college basketball, you've got your big conferences that are very much basketball driven or athletics driven. You know, the likes with Duke play in the, in the ACC and, and such, so forth. Ivy League is obviously known for academics, but d d how, does that change in any way how you guys approach the tournament? Because I guess you're there as a outsider, a long shot, etc. I mean, when you choose Princeton, you know that um, you're not only going to have to commit a lot of time to basketball, but also to your school and balance those. Um, so going into the tournament or just um, the season in general, we know that we are going to have that extra time demand of really high academics, but we don't let that affect how, um, how we go into games or how we prepare or make it us feel like less prepared. We still do what we need to do to prepare for our games and for the tournament, regardless of that academic pressure. What's your best memory of the tournament? Um, probably my freshman year when we beat 
uh, oh, I'm spacing on who it was, um, but the president was there. So my teammate, Leslie, um, she's the president's niece, actually. So he came to our game, and it was like one of the coolest things ever. Obama, I presume. Yeah, Obama, yeah. <laughs> Did you get to meet him? Um, we didn't, but we got to meet his wife a couple games earlier in the season when she came to our game in D.C., so that was also really cool. <laughs> What's that like when you're sitting there and the president is in the house? Yeah, it was honestly so surreal. Like, it didn't even feel like it was like, I don't, like, I didn't know what was going on, but it was, it was really cool looking back. And did you, what did you say to Michelle, or what did Michelle say to you? Um, so she addressed our team as a whole, and I think it was at halftime, so she basically just, like, said, um, encouraged us to, like, keep going, working hard. Um, and we ended up taking a picture with her at the end. But it was just so amazing to just, like, be in her presence, someone who's so inspirational to a lot of people in the States and outside of the States, too. It was really cool. Is that, I mean, mid-game, obviously, you're probably trying to focus, and your coaches probably want to say, okay, we need to make these adjustments or those adjustments. But what was it like in Buckout the second half there, having heard this rally speech from the first lady? It was really inspirational. I think, I don't remember exactly how that game went, but I can assume that we came out with a lot more fire and just a lot more passion to just, um, I don't know, show the first lady that we can do what she told us to. I imagine she could be a pretty decent coach if she wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> with Outside of college, because you played for Cameroon, so you're following your dad's footsteps, you're following your sister's footsteps again. I see having grown up in the States, what was the process of you going, I want to do this, how, how can I do this? Mm -hmm. So actually, they kind of reached out to us. Um, they've always known of my dad because he played for the team, obviously, and then um, when we started playing basketball, they kind of heard of us. So they reached out to us, um, asking us, inviting us to come play with them, and I mean, it was an opportunity that we couldn't, uh, turned down. I mean, playing for our country and representing our country in the same way our dad did was something that we really wanted to do and was really exciting for us. Had you been to Cameroon before that point? Um, I had not actually. That was my first time going. Well, so we actually went before the tournament um, for a family vacation, but then that same summer was when we went back for the training camp. So what's that like going out in the vacation and then subsequently going back for this, this, this homeland that your father came from? Is there What's the emotions like pitching up there for the first time? Um, going back to Cameroon, um, it was absolutely amazing. So um, my father is from uh, Limbe, which is like the English speaking, and my mom's from around Yaoundé, which is like the French speaking. So it was very cool to visit those two different areas and see like the contrast between them, but also the similarities. Um, and just even though we hadn't been there before, it, just going there, it felt so much like home. Like that's like where we belong, where our heart was. And then just seeing all of our family members and um, seeing some of them for the first time, it was a surreal experience. What surprised you most about it compared to, I guess, what you always grew up imagining, what it might be like? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had seen pictures, so it was kind of similar to what I had expected. But I guess um, the biggest thing was just the um, like the free feel of life. Like life is a lot slower paced there and it's a lot less um, stressful, I guess, in the States. And obviously going to Prince and everything's pretty high energy and kind of stressful. So just like being able to relax and just enjoy and people are just always happy and in a good mood and um, very welcoming a very close-knit community so that was probably the biggest biggest thing yeah how much did you kind of get to apart from sort of following back to the family roots how much did you kind of get a branch out and see the country and get a you know a taste for all of it yeah so we actually traveled around a lot um so our uncle um, kind of took us on like tours of different places and showed us all around different cities um different parts so it was really cool to see um, all the different parts of Cameroon, for sure. I mean, it's a country that, in a quiet way, has become quite potent at basketball because obviously Joel Embiid in Cameroon doing so well, All Star. You know, Luke Mwa well, Amute, uh, Pascal Sikam with the Raptors, etc. I know you're just getting a small taste, but why is there players coming out of Cameroon? Um, so I think uh, Cameroonian players have always been pretty good and pretty talented. It's just um, recently now or within like the couple, last decade or so, um, people are realizing that you can get an education through playing a sport. And so I think they're making it more of a priority to, you know, try and come to the States to play sports and get education. Um, and then also coaches in the States are now looking more to um, West African countries in general to um, get some players as well. So I think that's been a big part in, in um, more Cameroonian players coming out recently. I mean, everyone, especially in my generation, remembers the sort of crazy Cameroon football team that went to the to the World Cup, etc. And Roger Mila and people like that. As you were the first, probably the first African soccer team to make an international impact. 
you've played for the national team in Cameroon, obviously, in a few tournaments. Now, what is the level of basketball like for players maybe who are developed on the ground or even those who have just have maybe grown up in the country and gone away overseas? Um, the level of Cameroonian play. The level of play, the, you know, the development and the structure of it like. Oh, I think it's um, definitely getting a lot better now. Um, on my team, the last time around, um, we had some players who, like you said, had have played in Europe and some players who have only played in Cameroon. But um, I think the level is really increasing. Um, people are becoming uh, much more much more keen to playing sport and playing basketball. And um, yeah, so I think the level is definitely improving. You played with your sister, so you're going and obviously knowing someone on the team. But then you go and sort of meet other people on the team, get their experiences as well. How much does that kind of help you to, I guess, bond with the country and maybe learn more about the country than you would otherwise have? Yeah, so um, like I said, there's a very wide range of uh, Cameroonians, I would say, on our team. So some who grew up there, some who have moved away. Um, so I think just having those different aspects and those different perspectives on the country, and obviously people are from different cities in the country, um, has opened my eyes to see how diverse actually Cameroon is and how many different perspectives there are. What do you get from playing international basketball that you hadn't got from playing college and high school? Yeah, so one of my favorite things is playing against other countries because basketball is so much different. It's very much the same, but also very different as you go from country to country. And I think it's just very cool um, to see everybody representing their own country and then playing against other countries and seeing um, how their styles of play uh, vary depending on like the region they're from. Um, and it's just a very, a very humbling experience to play against so many different cultures, so many different backgrounds, and just be able to see so many different angles of basketball, that the sport that I've loved for so long. I mean, getting to play in an Afro basket, so the African equivalent of Euro basket, and obviously every country's got their pockets of fans coming along and supporters, and there is that national pride at stake. What was that like to go into that kind of atmosphere? Because I guess I suppose it's as close as you get to playing in a NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. Um, so Cameroonian, well, African fans in general are very, um, very passionate about their team. So it's definitely fun to play um, in front of the Cameroon, in front of Cameroonian like fans and crowd, um, and just feel that sense of pride and just such, such. Um, it's just so special to feel like you're representing like your whole country and everybody um, that resides there. So yeah. Then you go to an Olympic qualifying tournament, which was in Nantes, ahead of Rio Olympics. And okay, you guys were going in as long shots for that. But you're that close to an Olympics. When you go to that event, do you think, maybe, just maybe this might happen? Yeah, um, it was very overwhelming because that was my very first time playing with the Cameroon national team. Um, so looking back, if I had maybe had more experience in playing with them, it would have been, we could have maybe done... Um, better but it was definitely such a cool experience just knowing that you're actually so close to the olympics it's just like something that you've always wanted to do um but it also gives us more hope and more determination for the next time around because now we're obviously everybody's more experienced and we're more prepared to try and actually get there this time and this time rather than your older sister you'll have your younger sister i guess with you as well along for the ride so does that improve the odds or not you know would you choose that <laughs> um it's hard because they're very different players um but my younger sister is probably more plays more like me, so I think we'll, we might complement each other better. Um, and I've never really played with her um, in like organized basketball because we are five years apart. So like we were one year off from high school and one year off from college. So I think it'll be cool just actually playing together um, on the same team for the first time. How ridiculously cool would it be to play in an Olympics before you're done with this? It would like that's my dream. It would be <laughs> so amazing. Yeah. When you when you turn up for a national duty, does it? I mean, you take the learning that you've taken from college, and you've done a little bit of coaching in terms of grassroots coaching. But do you find yourself consciously trying to be a leader and to try and teach, or do you step back? Particularly with your dad as being the assistant coach, is also now I believe going to be the head coach on the team. How how do you try and take your knowledge and bring it to the national team program? Um, so my last two years at Princeton, especially the last year when I was a captain, I've definitely developed a lot of leadership qualities. Um, and then also now playing on pride when there's, um, basically everybody on the team is younger than me. Um, it's really made me develop my leadership skills. And I think now going back to the Cameroonian team, I'll be able to, um, use that in leading the players, not only on the court, but off the court and then just helping with like tactical things. Um, 
But yeah, definitely different from my first time around when I was just a sophomore, I think. So I was still pretty young, even in college basketball, and didn't really have as much experience as I'd want. So just going back now, I think that, yeah, definitely I will have that leadership role. Any crazy experience you've had while traveling on the road to different outposts and playing in Africa that's that's maybe been quite different to playing in the Ivy League? Um, in term like what do you mean? Just that stand out in terms of you know maybe some something that was a bit off, didn't quite work, or you know different arenas or whatever. Um, nothing that crazy. I mean, international basketball is just different from um, NCAA basketball in general. So I just think getting used to like the rules and the different um all the different little um tactical things in the game was probably the biggest adjustment but it wasn't anything too crazy you come to the pride and they're a team that had a lot of transition that's probably understating it last last summer it's a very young team with a lot of young scottish players on the team you come in here obviously coach bart sangers is looking for you to to definitely be a leader on this have you enjoyed that responsibility? Because you've got, you've got players who are 15, 16, 17 on this team that you're playing at. It's so very different to Princeton. How have you kind of, I guess, managed that yourself while not forgetting you actually do your job on the court? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so at first coming in, I was thinking it was going to be a pretty big challenge. I was kind of nervous about it, but I really enjoyed it um, just because they all work so hard and just seeing, just helping them along and helping them um, – Helping them be their best is one of my greatest um, accomplishments, I think, here. Just in terms of, you know, that leadership, I mean, how do you set a tone, I guess, when practice and games, etc.? Yeah, um, I think just leading by example, because um, I've never, I haven't really, be, like, all my life, I haven't really been that big of a vocal leader. So just um, leading by example and um, always just working hard, being the hardest worker, being... Um, show, being very coachable, showing them how to be coachable and just showing them, kind of showing them the ropes in that way and just like my actions. Is it energizing as well though, playing with some of the players that are that young that have got their whole careers ahead of them as well? It is so cool and I love watching, even just in the couple of months I've been here, just seeing them develop and um, I can already see that they have such bright futures in basketball but also just in life in general. I mean, they're such fun players to play with and just uh, fun people to be around. Um, so it's definitely like um, kind of a motivator and energizer and an inspiration just to be around them and play with them. We said at the top of this, we're sitting here in the middle of Old Town Edinburgh. So the castle's just up the road. The palace is down the hill. You're here for a stay. What have you done to kind of make the most of this overseas experience away from just playing basketball or away from academics? Yeah. Um, so we've, I've been to um, Arthur's seat. Um, I haven't been to the castle yet, which I still need to go to. But um, so I've been become really close with the other Americans, um, Dory and Raquel. And Dory has been here for, I think, five years now. So she's been really helpful in like showing us different like little spots in Edinburgh and just kind of taking us around. And it's such a beautiful and um, a beautiful city. And there's just so much to do. So I really hope I can uh, do the most of it before I leave. But it's, it's been so much fun just exploring and seeing different things. Do you ever get them to sort of, when you're on a road trip, take, take the bus to some sites and cities or whatever, get off and take a photo or get back on? I'm sorry, it sounds like National Lampoon or something, but you know, do, do you try and take in these trips around the country? Um, when we're on away trips, we don't really do much except for just driving safe to the gym and playing. And, but um, we did go to Barcelona for a tournament um, around Christmas time, and then we got to sightsee a little bit, which was really fun. And that was a really cool experience just to like, see other countries um, of Europe. But um, then I also went to London a little bit with my dad while he was here. But I'm hoping um, in the spring, maybe after a season, to see more of Edinburgh, see more of um, the UK in general, and then maybe a couple of other Europe, European countries. But When you've got the degree from, from Ivy League and then you get your master's from University of Edinburgh, do you keep playing after this? Or what, where do you see this going when you've obviously got a brain? You'd like to use it, I guess, at some point. What, what's the kind of long-term plan in this? Yeah, so ideally, um, if my body allows, if I'm healthy enough, I'd like to play for a couple more years um, and just kind of do the same thing, play in other countries and just experience those cultures and see, just kind of travel and um, use basketball to see other things. And then um, whenever I do finish playing in a couple of years, I'd like to use my um, degree that I get here from sports management to 
work in any sports firm, uh, whether that be like FIBA or anything like that, because it also has an international development uh, component of my degree here. So just using that in some way to mesh like sports and international something, I don't know. So we'll see. So maybe the first female secretary general of FIBA at some point. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Well, we wish you very best of luck. We, we enjoy the rest of your stay, of course, with, with Caledonia Pride, and the very best of luck for the rest of the season. Tia, thank you very much for joining the MVP Cup. Thank you so much for having me. That's all for this edition. You can download previous editions at MVP247.com. We'll have a new one soon, but for me, Mark Woods, thanks for listening, and catch you soon.